Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Corporate Experiences Healthcare Series featuring a virtual field trip to the Red Cross and Red Cross Blood Services. Um, my name's Dee Dee Engel, as Jen said, and um, as Ms. Barber said, and I am uh, your host today from Wender Weiss Foundation for Children. Uh, and we have partnered with the Red Cross to bring you this event. We're very excited to be back here with Andrew Hill High School and all of you from the Medical Magnet Program. We're going to begin with an introduction to the Red Cross and Red Cross Blood Services from the Regional Manager of Donor Recruitment, Carrie Morris. Hi there, thank you so much for having us. We are thrilled to be here with you today and to share about blood donation and blood collections. Uh, we specifically work out in Northern California and help to stabilize our blood supply here in the area. Red Cross is also responsible for uh, providing 40% uh, of the nation's blood. So to those in need um, across the nation. And um, so we are here today with uh, several folks from the Red Cross and we'd like to share a, a field trip with you. We're gonna walk you through a blood drive. Uh, they will show you the different stations of the blood drive uh, where you start. Some, and you'll see some things if you've been to a blood drive before, but not in the last year or so, you'll see some things that have changed um, through COVID and adjustments that we have had to make. Janae Pope, one of our account managers is gonna be walking you through that uh, blood drive. She'll show you each station and we'll also follow a donor through her donation of a Power Red donation as well. So with that, let's jump into the field trip. My name is Janae. I am an account manager with the American Red Cross in Northern California. We're here at a blood drive in Lodi, California today. It's a special blood drive and it's special because it is in honor of a little girl. Her name is Olivia. She's seven years old and unfortunately she has a brain tumor. But I want everyone to know she is seeking treatment and she's doing okay. So I don't want anyone to worry. But that's why this blood drive is special. I'm gonna take you on a little tour, let you know what we do at a blood drive and how it works. And in honor of blood drive is really special. Our sponsors put that on to bring awareness to the need for blood because every two seconds in America, someone needs blood. You ready to go inside? Let's do it. So due to COVID, I do have my mask on and it is some um, things that we have to do before we make it all the way in, like get our temperature checked. We have to stop here, donors stop here, read this information before they go in. It's just basic COVID, COVID information. Follow me. This is where we get my temperature check. Everyone has to get the temperature check before they enter the blood drive. This is our lovely machine here. I'm gonna stand in front of it. Get scanned. I'm a little short, so I have to get my right out of the position. Temperature is normal. Temperature is normal. This is our check-in station. This is our lovely volunteer here. Richard, he's awesome. He's going to check me in. Okay. Did you do your rapid pass? Yes, I did. Okay. And your ID. Okay. My ID for today. We got it. Got it. We all checked in. We're ready to go. Ready to go. I'm going to use the hand sanitizer. So this lovely section over here is going to be our canteen. This is where our donors come and get their snacks, juice, cookies, crackers, water after they've given blood. Before you get to this lovely process, though, you have to stop over here. This is our health history. This is like a mini physical. This is where I'll get my blood pressure taken and my temperature again. So this is where you have you have to pass everything in this section to make it over to our next section, which is where you're gonna get your blood drawn. I'm gonna jump up on the bed here. So after I'm done out of some history, I'll jump up here like this. Pull, roll my sleeve up. I'll take my blood here, wrap it in a nice red wrap, make 
after I'm all secure, then when I'm all done, I'll go to that lovely area that I showed you earlier to have my juice and my cookies. That's it. And with my one donation, I have the potential to save up to three lives. I work with the team that sets up all our blood drives here in Northern California. Hi guys, I'm Darlene. I'm a phlebotomist here with the Red Cross. All right, well, we hope you enjoyed the, the field trip and had a chance to see a blood drive, especially if you've not seen one in the past. Um, from here, we are gonna go into um, an educational uh, presentation from Janae Pope. It's time to go over the educational piece of the American Red Cross. You have gone on a blood drive tour with me and you've heard my story. So now it's time to go into more detail about why it's important to donate blood and why the American Red Cross collects blood. I have a PowerPoint and I promise you I won't read it word for word, slide from slide. Um, if for any reason you want to look back at the PowerPoint, I'm sure that that can be arranged. Do keep in mind as we go through it that there is some very important information on each slide. And again, if you want to review it at a later time, I'm sure there's something that we can work out. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So what we're going to go over today is some information about blood, the market, operations, donors, sponsors, and blood drives. There is two different sides of the house for their American Red Cross. One side is disaster services and they take care of victims who have been affected by fires or floods, things of that nature. And then the biomass side, which is the side that I work on, that's where we collect the blood. And on the biomass side, our mission is the American Red Cross Biomedical Services will fulfill the needs of the American people by providing our partners with safe, reliable, cost-effective, and sustainable blood products and related services. Blood and its components. Blood is a specialized fluid that delivers nutrients and oxygen to cells in the body and transport waste products away from the cells. So if you look over here um, at the little, little test tube on the right hand side, it gives you a breakdown of those components that we collect at the Red Cross, plasma, white blood cells, and platelets, red blood cells. And on the left, it gives you a breakdown of what each component does and why it's important. Whole blood contains red cells and white cells and platelets. Red cells carries oxygen from the lungs. Platelets are small colorless cells in the blood and their main function is to promote clotting and stop bleeding. Okay, plasma is the liquid portion of the blood and then cryo is a portion of plasma rich in proteins such as clotting factors. As we go further into the PowerPoint, these components will be broken down um, again, but this is just to start us off. Okay, blood transfusions are part of modern healthcare. Every two seconds, a unit of blood is transfused to a patient in the US. And over here on the left hand side, again, this is the breakdown of the components that we collect at the Red Cross and red blood cells can last up to 42 days on the shelf. Platelets can last up to five days on the shelf. 
Plasma Frozen is one year on the shelf and Cryo is also one year on the shelf. And each component serves a different purpose in, in the human body. And each component is used for something different. Uh, such as red blood cells um, is used for trauma situations. Uh, say you were in a car accident and when you came in, you needed blood. It's a very good possibility you're going to get red blood cells. And then platelets is used for like cancer patients dealing with leukemia and organ transplants. And then plasma is also used in trauma situations, burn situations, and also surgery. And then cryo is also used in trauma and surgery situations as well. Okay. Blood can only be transfused in the right type combinations. So basically, we have to make sure that when we give someone a unit of blood, that the blood types match, because if they do not, it can cause big problems, and we definitely don't want to do that. But a fun fact for you all to know is that o neg is the universal blood type. So say you were in an accident or something happened, and you needed blood when you came into the hospital and your blood type is uh, say A or B, you can get a unit of O neg blood because it is the universal blood type. Blood types are inherited, so you get them from your parents, your family, no one can pick their blood type. Unfortunately, it does not work that way. Blood types are determined by antigens and there are over 600 known antigens, some unique to racial or ethnic groups. Well-matched blood can decrease the risk of complications related to transfused therapy, especially in patients who receive lifelong transfusions. It is critical to increase the number of available blood donors from all racial and ethnic groups. Donor diversity is essential to increase availability of blood products to match the needs of diverse patients blood needs. The need for blood is constant. Since readiness requires at least a few days to allow for testing and delivery, emergency supply means early preparation and consistency. Every two seconds, someone in the U.S. needs blood, and I'm going to keep saying that, you guys, because if you think about it, one 1,000, two 1,000, somebody needs blood. Approximately 36,000 units of red blood cells are needed every day in the U.S. Blood cannot be manufactured, okay? That means that we cannot make blood. It can only come from volunteer donors, okay? And that's not going to change. We cannot create blood in a factory, in a laboratory. It has to come from volunteer donors. About 1.7 million people are diagnosed with cancer each year. Many need blood during chemotherapy treatments, some daily. Over a thousand babies are born with sickle cell anemia each year, which often requires frequent blood transfusions throughout life. A single car accident victim can require as many as 100 pints of blood. Nearly 21 million blood components are transfused in the U.S. every year. The journey of donating blood. So step one is the donation. And that's when the donor comes in. They go through the whole process of registering and um, going through a mini physical because we have to ensure that that person is healthy enough to actually donate blood. After the donation process, then uh, we're going to send the blood for processing. And that's where the blood gets scanned into a database and then that's where it gets separated, and then that's where the tubes are sent for testing, okay? Then step three, very important part, is the testing. Every single um, blood component that we collect is tested, and that's very important, of course. We test it for HIV and hepatitis and uh, syphilis, things of that nature. And then step four is storage, and this is after the blood has been tested and it's packaged and ready to go to a hospital, then that's where we have to keep it um, in a refrigerator. Um, and like I, I told you, different components um, last for different amounts of time. So the storage aspect is very important. And then distribution, which is the last step, and that's where we are, excuse me, that's when we actually send the blood to the hospitals. Okay, the blood donation process. Donating blood is a safe process with sterile needles used once per donor and discarded. So 
I want to make that clear. We only use the needle one time. It's a brand new needle each and every time. And then after we're done, we get rid of it. Okay, the blood donation is simple and easy. It's just a few steps. You register, you check in, you go to the health history and have a mini physical, and then you actually go to the bed and give your blood. And then after that, you have cookies and juice. That's everyone's, excuse me, favorite part. Okay, I want you to know that every donor is given a confidential mini physical, and that's where we check their temperature, blood pressure, pulse, hemoglobin to ensure that it is safe for the donor to give. The actual blood donation of whole blood typically takes less than 10 to 12 minutes. The entire process takes one hour, but I want to make it clear. It's not going to be one hour of a needle in your arm. The whole process from your check-in to your mini physical blood donation and refreshments, all of that is what actually takes an hour. People get afraid and think a needle is going to be in their arm for an hour, and that's definitely not the case. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody keeps that in mind. Donors must be 17 years old, 16 in some states with a um, parental permission slip, okay? And there are height and weight requirements. 84% of blood is collected at mobile drives, and a mobile drive is so cool. That is what we went on our tour, and basically we get places that will have us come in, we'll set up all of the equipment, and you know, we basically are bringing the blood um, donation site to that facility. So a lot of businesses and high schools um, participate in this because it's easier for them to do a blood drive if we come to them. Okay, our blood programs and sponsors. Okay, so 84% of all units collected are at sponsored mobile blood drives. And again, remember the mobile blood drives is when we take the blood drive to a certain location. As you can see, 29% um, is basically community blood drives, which can be um, uh, like at community centers, you know, or recreational centers, things of that nature. 21.1% is businesses. 15.3% is religious um, organizations, 6.3% is healthcare, and then government and military is 5.6%, and then education is about 22.6%. So as you can see, education, community, and businesses um, really help out with the mobile drives the most. Okay, the successful blood drive. Staff schedules are set four weeks in advance. Events, excuse me. Tough to add, cancel, or change drives inside that small window. Drives should be booked 12 weeks in advance to allow both the sponsors and Red Cross to do proper planning and recruiting. Okay, so some people call and say, oh, I'm going to do a blood drive next week. Um, and that's just because they don't know um, the process yet. That's all. And part of my job is to explain that process to them and give them enough time to understand the process and the requirements um, that go along with hosting a blood drive. OK, donation safety during COVID. Of course, when COVID hit last year, this was a big thing. We had blood drives, you know, canceling left and right because, you know, this was so new to everyone. No one knew what to expect. But as I mentioned, you know, we are regulated by the FDA. CDC is involved as well, and we have precautions that we must take during the pandemic. So we have temperature checks. Everyone must have their temperature checked before they actually enter the blood drive. And then they also get their temperature checked again when they're in a little mini physical. Everyone, including the staff and the volunteers, must wear a mask, donors as well. Okay, we clean each and everything after every single donor use. So one time a donor can go into the health history and once they're done, we go and wipe it all down for the next donor. Okay, of course, we're practicing social distancing and we're trying to make sure all of our stations are set six feet apart and we try to keep our donors six feet apart as well. Testing for COVID-19 antibodies. So this was a big thing, of course, um, once COVID hit. Okay, so the Red Cross was testing for the antibodies. 
Okay, so the COVID-19 antibody test used by the Red Cross is available through emergency use authorization by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Test results may indicate if the donor's immune system has produced antibodies to the coronavirus, regardless of whether they develop symptoms, okay? The Red Cross is not testing donors to diagnose illness, okay? So just keep that in mind. This is to see if you have the antibodies in your system, not to see if you actually had COVID. Okay, individuals who believe that they may be ill with COVID-19 should postpone their donation, okay? Like other blood donation screenings, antibody testing is part of the blood donation testing process, which occurs at no charge to the donor, okay? So we did not charge anyone to get the test for the antibodies, okay? About the results. Donors need to have a successful donation to receive the COVID-19 antibody test results, okay? Per standard donation procedure, only successful donations are sent to our laboratory for testing. Donors can get the results of the antibody test by logging into their blood donor account on the blood donor app or online within one to two weeks after the donation, okay? There's also plenty of places that you can visit on our website to get more information about the testing and what it entails and things of that nature. But this was something that um, Red Cross was very happy to offer, and I know that there were a lot of donors who were uh, very happy to receive this test. Okay, of course, I want to thank you all for your time. I hope that this has shed a little bit of light for you about the importance of donating blood and why we at the Red Cross do what we do. Um, at the end of this, I just want to share this last video with you. It's very heartwarming, and I just want you guys to watch the video in its entirety because it's very important, and I'm telling you, it's going to touch you. Why have you never donated blood before? Intimidated to go in. Of needles. Needles? I'm probably just going to check your pain. There's no needles yet. Well, I have a very special helper here today that I think might be able to help you through the process. Really? Oh, hi. <laughs> well, hi there. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Are you scared? A little nervous. Well, I'm going to help you get through it today. They know what they're doing. Nothing's going to explode. Oh, good. You ready to get started? Hold your hand. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. If you want to hold my friend AJ, you can. Thank you. You're going to feel a pinch and a sting. Okay, so whatever you do, don't look at the arm. Eye contact. All right. I'm here to entertain you. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. Interrupting cow. No. Girl, I love your ripped jeans. Are your knees a little cold? <laughs> One, two, Three. One, two. <laughs> Dang it. Miss Emma, you are almost there. Wow. Girl, you're almost done. Was that as hard as you thought it would be? No. It's easier. I should bring you every time <laughs> I get a shot. There's actually a reason you're helping here today. I'm so familiar with the blood donation process. So I have a blood disease that is called sickle cell anemia type SS. I've been hospitalized over 72 times and have blood transfusions over 70 times. A blood transfusion actually saved my mom. Oh, wow. When I was five months old, I went into kidney failure. I needed to have a lot of blood transfusions. And when I get the blood transfusions, it makes me feel like I'm me again, like I'm a kid, I can do anything. Thank you so much. Thank you for donating from the bottom of my heart. Girl, give me a hug. Well, I think everything we've talked about that kept my focus the most. And not only I'm thankful, but my mom is too. Oh, is your mom here with you? Oh my God. Actually, all my family is very grateful. No way. <laughs> On behalf of whoever's going to get your blood, thank you so much. It means so much to us. Without you, she would not be here. I never got to thank that person that gave me their blood. I could at least thank you. It means so much to my family. So thank you. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. Group hug. <laughs> this makes it 
a million percent worthwhile. I'm literally honored and privileged to be able to do this. Would you do it again? Oh, definitely. I would happily do it again. I feel like we should pinky promise. <laughs> You're all done. I can hug you with both eyes. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this PowerPoint with me. Please remember that every two seconds in America, someone needs blood. So if you're eligible or you know someone that's eligible, please encourage them to go out and donate blood. As you can see, you can touch um, so many lives uh, with that one donation. So again, thank you. If you guys have any questions or need anything, please, you can reach out to me. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed Janae's educational presentation. I hope it answered some questions for you and uh, brought light the need for blood every single day. So with that, we will jump into um, four videos from folks that work here with us at American Red Cross. We've got two phlebotomists, as well as our trainer who trains all of our phlebotomists uh, for getting ready to be out in the field, um, as well as Janae Pope, our own account manager that um, you just heard from as well, and uh, learn a little bit about their personal stories as well. Hey guys, my name is Weedy. I work for the American Red Cross. I'm a phlebotomist and a driver for the company. I've been here for about a year now, uh, April 27th, March a year. And I got into this job because I was going to school for nursing. I was taking my prerequisites for nursing. I was a donor in the past, so I found out you didn't need any experience to do a job like this, specifically for the Red Cross. The Red Cross has their own uh, training. So I decided to apply, got the job, and I've been here ever since. And I love it. So what do I like most about my work is the fact that I get to interact with different people every single day. They're all unique in their own way. I get to learn new things from new people. And most of these people I would have never met if it wasn't for this job. So what qualities and personality traits uh, do I believe are most helpful for a job like this? I believe you have to be very confident in your role and just very loving and caring for other people. And you have to be able to interact with them uh, in a way that you would want to have someone interact with you and just be very loving and caring towards them and, and genuinely care, not just go out there and put on a, a customer service act. Um, I believe a job like this requires that kind of care because you're caring for others' health and you're also saving lives while you're at it. Hi guys, my name is Cynthia Chestank and I've been with American Red Cross for four years now. And throughout my journey, um, I was given several opportunities to advance my skills in other areas, um, which I am still active in today. So I wear many hats. I am a phlebotomist, a driver, a 2RBC tech, a charge, and a CMC. And just to give you a brief description about some of the positions. Um, CMC stands for Collection Material Coordinator. Um, as a blood collection material coordinator, I provide support to the collection operation by inquiring and distributing and maintaining supplies and equipment that is used in the day-to-day -day blood collection operation. So I work in a warehouse and I build the supply cards that they, we use on the blood drives and also 
Um, I store and maintain all the equipment and supplies here at the warehouse to make sure that they ain't um, up to par for use. Um, driver. Um, the driver, basically, I load and unload the vehicles um, and assist with transporting transporting the equipment and supplies um, to and from the drives and assist with the setup of the collection drives um, upon arrival. And phobonymous. Um, the phobonymous, I'm the person who conducts the draw on the donors. The person who performs the blood collection and we have to ensure that the donation meets goal and regulated requirements to make sure it, it can be safely transferred to others. As a phobonymous or if you work in any medical field, you must have some have compassion, um, good customer service and patience as well. That's very important. Um, I want to always give my donor the best experience as possible um, when they're there. And I love making people laugh, making people smile. So sometimes I even sing and dance for my donors. You want to hear me sing? Okay. <clears throat> you ready? Just kidding. I try to personally connect with my donors and listen to their stories. I love to listen to the reasons why they're there donating. And I also try to help them understand the value of their donation. The 2RBC technician. The 2RBC technician performs the same task as the phlebotomist. The only difference is we utilize a MCS Plus machine which collects double other red cells and we return your platelets and your plasma back to using a saline solution, which allows you to be more hydrated after donation and makes you feel, allows you to feel better. Um, it is completely safe. It's a completely safe process. Nothing touches the machines at all. All donations are completed with individual kits for each donor. There are two important things that I would like for you to remember if you ever decide to donate. Or if you know someone who wants to donate, um, you have to make sure that you eat a very healthy meal um, at the beginning of the day and drink plenty and plenty of water before days before coming in to donation. This will help prevent any um, possible reactions and it also allows the veins to kind of expand. Um, charge. Um, basically, the charge is the person who oversees the drives to ensure the balance of production, um, donor care, and quality of requirements that's required to meet daily blood collection goals. Um, we have to always stay proactive, maintain a friendly and positive environment for the donors, our staff, and our volunteers. Um, also, we have to assist with um, complaints and concerns that may arrive or any solutions that, that need to be resolved. Um, one question was asked, um, what or who inspired or motivated you to pursue this career? Um, my 13 year old brother that I lost due to a gun violence is my motivation. I remember the surgeons telling me that they administered 32 pints of blood to try to save his life. Unfortunately, um, because his organs were too far damaged, he didn't survive. <clears throat> I don't think people really know how important it is to donate until somebody they know or even themselves are infected or are in need of blood. Um, I should know. I'm one of those people. But I'm not any longer. Um, because of the donors, my brother had a fighting chance to live and I didn't know how to thank them. I have a passion for helping others and I want to be a part of an organization that I, that I know is dedicated to doing that and making a difference in people's lives. And I also wanted to give back um, to try to say thank you to the donor. Because every donor that I, that I work with every day, I, I thank them not just because we're supposed to thank them, I really thank them because it's really mean a lot to me. Because because of them donating, someone else has also have a fighting chance of surviving or getting better. 
Um, there are a lot of other individuals that, that are in need and help, like babies. We have donors that donate just for babies. Um, sick cell patients, cancer patients, um, blood, um, people who have blood disorders and bone marrow patients as well, and the list goes on. So I made a promise to myself to continue my, my purpose in saving lives of others in my brother's honor. Uh, other question is, do you plan to pursue any additional training or other position in your field? Um, yes, we also have to keep up to par with any training, especially if there is to have been any changes in policies or procedures. Um, American Red Cross also have a lot of different other um, training that you can take on your own for self-improvement and etc. In addition to the training that is required for your job, because I'm a charge, I have to be CPR certified. And as working as a phlebotomist and in the warehouse, I also have to be trained in regulated medical waste. I'm not ready now, but my next goal is to train as an OJI. Um, as an OJI, um, an OJI person is who, is who trains the new hires in the field. And that would be my next goal. So um, I'm at the end of my time. Just want to say thank you guys for listening. And I hope to see you at the next donation. And have a good night. Bye. Hello. My name is Abiba Fitzgerald Brito. And I'm here today to talk to you about what it's like to be a technical trainer for the American Red Cross. My main function is to teach staff new skills. Those skills include mainly automated collection, such as platelet plasma and RBC extraction. The typical class time is about a week in the classroom with me, and then they will go out to their respective sites where they will work with an on-the-job instructor who will help them to become familiar and competent with the processes that they were trained on. There is both vendor training coming straight from the manufacturer, as well as the Red Cross procedural documents that are uh, reviewed when they come into the classroom. I've often been asked, what are the traits that make a good instructor? So the main ones that I found to be most important are patience. There's going to be a lot of questions that your staff will have, and you want to make sure that you are well versed in all of the subjects of which you're teaching. So that means spending time reviewing documents and making sure that you are prepared to answer those questions. And if you don't know the answer, that happens sometimes as an instructor, we can't know everything, but make sure that you ask questions and get clarification prior to presenting that material. Another thing is prep your materials ahead of time. Print out all of the documents that you're going to need in your class so that you're not having to take time out of your day to run and print off materials. Another thing with adult learners, we come in with a lot of experience and we want to make sure that we respect the fact that they have this experience and use it in a positive way to help them learn. So anybody who is thinking of being an instructor for the American Red Cross, it's a wonderful opportunity to be involved in a process that helps to save lives. I've been here in education again for about 15 years, and it has been a wonderful experience. Thank you so much for taking time out to listen today. Take care. My name is Janae Pope and I am an account manager with the American Red Cross in Northern California. And as an account manager, I have to make sure that we have enough blood drives each and every month in my assigned territory to supply the hospitals with the blood products that they need. And I must say that working with the Red Cross has been an amazing journey and I'm truly thankful for that journey. And something that's really neat about the American Red Cross is that they will train you. All of the training and skills that I have acquired have 
have been through the American Red Cross training programs. And I'm sure you all know that there are companies that want you to come in already knowing something or having a skill, but the Red Cross will show you how to do the jobs there. And that's something that's really neat about working for the American Red Cross. Um, when I started at the Red Cross um, almost 14 years ago, I was fresh out of high school. Um, probably graduated a month before I started and the plan was to work at the Red Cross and get myself through college and I did start that journey and then life happens and I kind of had to you know put school on hold but I am currently in college now and I'm almost done yay I'm almost at the finish line so I just want you all to know that you can work and have a career and go to school at the same time um, now if you can go straight to college right out of high school that's great but for those of you that cannot please know that you can work and go to school at the same time I am living proof of that and that's something that's so cool about the American Red Cross because they do support me in that and they support for anyone that wants to further their education and I'm just thankful that they have been supportive in that situation because they they want me to pursue a higher level of education so I'm just thankful for that so please know that there are companies out there that will allow you to pick up skills and work and go to school at the same time just know that um, if I had to answer the question about what I love about my job the most, it would be helping people. I'm a kind-hearted person and helping people makes me feel good. And knowing that I had a small part to do with someone receiving the blood that they needed makes me feel good. I know I may not be the doctor or the nurse that actually gives the patient the blood, but knowing that I played a small part in that blood product being available for someone makes me feel good. And that's definitely um, what I love about my job the most. Not like, but love. That's what I love about my job the most. If I had to answer the question about what or who motivated me to pursue this career, I have to tell you a little story. Like I mentioned, when I started at Red Cross, I was fresh out of high school and I didn't know the importance of um, donating blood I, I did it and I worked in several different departments at the American Red Cross through my career but the one that I'm currently in I'm um, during a recruitment that happened because in 2015 my husband was shot and needed blood and he was able to get the blood that he needed it was available thank God and because he got that blood, my family and myself were able to say our goodbyes to him because unfortunately he didn't make it and that was due to his injuries. Um, that wasn't because he didn't get the blood that he needed, so I'm thankful for that. And after that event, that's what changed my career. It pushed me to move over to donor recruitment because I knew that I wanted to make sure I did whatever I could to help another family that faced a similar situation um, that I did in 2015. I wanted to make sure I did whatever I could, my part, to make sure blood is available for anyone who needs it. And that's definitely what pushes me now. And that's definitely what has brought me to the level of being an account manager. Um, that situation, of course, sad, it saddened me, of course. Um, and it was hard, I must say, but I'm thankful that it happened because it truly made me see what I wanted to do. And I enjoy what I do so much that even later on, I, I, I still want to be with the Red Cross. And what I mean by that is I want to retire from the Red Cross. That's how important the mission of the Red Cross is to me. And I'm just thankful that I've had this opportunity. And I just want you all to know that it's okay to not necessarily know where you're going right away when you get out of school. And that's okay. I've worked my way to the position that I am in. And it's okay if you have to do that. Just don't give up and don't be afraid to try and don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something because you can. I'm sitting here as living proof that you can have a career and go to school. You can do both and there's nothing wrong with trying to find your path. Um, you, you don't have to know it right away. It's nothing wrong with that and I just want you all to know that 
you can do this no matter what if you go to school as soon as you get out of high school you can do it don't give up don't stop if you have to work and do school at the same time you can do it don't give up and don't let anything deter you and again the Red Cross is special to me and will always be special to me. They've shown me so much and in a way I feel like I've grown up at the Red Cross. And once you find the place that you belong, you'll know. And Red Cross is definitely the place that I belong. So again, college is great. Do whatever you can to finish. But again, don't forget, you can have a career and do school at the same time. If any of you have questions or want to hear more about my story, please let me know. I'm happy to talk to you all in more detail about my journey, but I hope that my journey inspires you in some way. Don't give up, work hard, and you can get to wherever you want to be. I assure you of that. You all take care. Bye-bye. Well, we hope you enjoyed the stories and learning a little bit more about some of the various jobs at American Red Cross. Um, I think, and Janae, thank you again for sharing your story. Um, it is touching and, and gets me every time. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I do wanna give Joanna a minute uh, to jump on camera as well. And um, thank you, Joanna. And we've got lots of questions and it looks like more have come through. So. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time, so I'm just going to dive right in. So, uh, Janae, you want to tell us what a day on the job looks like? Yes, of course. So, um, for the start of the day, the collection staff go to our warehouse. That's what Cynthia was talking about. She prepares all the materials that the staff go and pick up on the day of a blood drive. So they have to pack the truck. We have these big trucks. They're like U-Haul trucks. And we have to pack all the equipment um, to take it to the facility where we're going to hold the blood drive. So that must be done first. So those staff members do have to start earlier than the other staff members to get the truck ready to go. Um, once we get the truck to the location, then we have to unload everything and set everything up. Um, and then we have to, you know, check our equipment and everything to make sure things are working properly. And then we have the blood drive and that's where we went on the tour and our donors check in, they get their blood drawn, they have their cookies and then they go home. So that's pretty much, you know, how our day to day goes. We have about six to seven blood drives a day. Um, as an account manager, because that's pretty much for the collection staff, um, we have to ensure that the space is ready to go and everything that the staff need to make it a successful day um, is also ready to go. And we have to also be there for any donor questions or anything like that if, if we're needed for that type of thing. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. So one of the questions was, what's the craziest situation that you've had at a blood drive? And I'll say, while it's not crazy, we've dealt with power outages and natural disasters. And uh, Janae can attest to this. We deal with kind of, we get thrown a lot of curveballs. Um, but I will say uh, one of the more unique drives that I ever got to work on was with a Cal Fire firefighter up in Tuolumne County uh, who was 20 years old when he was struck by, um, um, on his motorcycle by a truck. And um, he was rushed to the hospital, used, uh, 100 pints of blood. Um, unfortunately, he did not make it, but each year his dad wants to replenish those 100 units of blood that he used, and he hosts a drive that is uh, sponsored by all of fire, the fire departments in Tuolumne County. So really unique situation in that he took his tragedy and made something really positive out of it. Joanna, what led you into this career and who or what inspired you? So um, I would say almost similar to what Janae had shared and maybe even Cynthia in their stories, but I would say that the, this job and the American Red Cross found me. Um, it started out as something temporary. Um, I was really good at Excel in Microsoft and they needed a project having to do with Excel. And 12 years later, I'm still here. Um, I think what got me to stay is the people. I had a really great team that I worked with. Um, and then really learning more and more about the need for blood, finding out that only 38% of the population is eligible to donate and only 5% actually donate. I was like, that's not a lot of people. Like I wanna help, you know, let people know. Cause I also, I didn't know 
I was 22 and I didn't know that there was a need for donating blood. So I was like, okay, now, now I know and now I want other people to know. And then shortly after starting um, at the Red Cross, my grandmother needed blood um, for a heart surgery that she was having. And I was so thankful that there was blood. And so that's just, it can be routine and you just need to have a blood transfusion, just like one unit. But having that one unit available helped her just have a smooth surgery and then just, you know, go on. And um, so that was, that was huge. And just being able to be part of something that helps get blood in hospitals year round in the middle of the night when they need it um, the most. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So we had a lot of questions about uh, how long it takes to become a phlebotomist and questions around the training. So um, we do not require uh, anything outside of a high school diploma in order to come in into our phlebotomy program. As Aviva talked about, we do all the on-the-job training. We actually just launched a completely new program with our collections training. And um, basically you will do a combination of virtual learning. Um, and it's kind of cool, they send out uh, 3D virtual learning glasses. And that, and you'll also be out in the field and learning and honing your craft. And um, the whole process start to finish is six weeks. And in six weeks, you are out on the floor and uh, taking blood and um, you know you are working as a, a full-time phlebotomist. Uh, the questions also touches on what skills or qualities are most important. I think you probably got a sense from the videos that compassion is huge, right? And um, you know, Weedy talked a bit about, it's not really just about customer service, it's about connecting with folks and really genuinely caring about them. So that's, that's, that I would say is the biggest thing is having the willingness to um, work with folks, especially some folks that might be nervous about donating and um, yeah, and, and just continuing to push and learn and hone your craft. Janae, you wanna talk a bit about where you grew up, um, went to school, and then did your background influence your career choice? I know you talked about it a bit in your video as well. Right, so I grew up in Oakland, California. Um, I went to high school at Skyline uh, High School, which is a very popular high school in Oakland. Um, I would say that growing up, I was very involved in church. Now that's part of my family's background. And I've been taught from an early age that you should help people in need, especially if there's something that you have um, that they don't, you should definitely help those type of people. So that's just something that has been, you know, with me since being a child. So that part of growing up definitely helped influence uh, what I do at the Red Cross. Awesome. And with that, were you thinking about your career in high school? And when did you start thinking about working for Red Cross? So in high school, yes, I definitely was thinking about my career. And like I mentioned on the video, um, the plan was to work at Red Cross is to really help myself get through school. And then I really wanted to go into like the world of um, counseling or therapy. That is the original plan that I made out of high school, but like Joanna mentioned, the Red Cross kind of found me, and now I don't know what I would do without the Red Cross, actually, so, so yes, I, I was thinking about it in high school, but it wasn't the Red Cross, um, it just happened to turn out that the Red Cross is what I was going to be doing, and that's, you know, what I was looking for, and I picked therapy, and, and I'm, as I mentioned in the video, I'm going to school right now for that, but Red Cross is where my heart is, and I just wanted to make sure that I finished school because it was a personal goal for myself, and I want to show my family that, you know, I can do it, but Red Cross is where I want to be, and nothing will change that. Well, we're glad to hear that. We want you to stick around. All right, and while I would have loved to have a phlebotomist on the call with us today, they are all out in the field. Uh, we've got a lot of blood drives going on today and they are out collecting a much needed blood products. So the question was, what are your favorite aspects of being a full bottomist? And what I would say is, I, I think most of the folks and uh, Janae or Joanna, you could chime in. 
but I believe most of our folks feel that they're making a difference. So it is hard work and uh, they're out in the field every day out collecting blood, but at the end of the day, they know that they've made a difference, they've cared for others, and uh, they truly are, are out there saving lives. Well, Janae, I, I don't think you're gonna have, say yes to this, but have you ever felt overwhelmed or frustrated on the job? And if yes, how did you cope with it? Well, um, you know, as anything in life, you face challenges. And <laughs> of course I get frustrated sometimes. It's just the nature of the job because, you know, the biggest thing we have to do is plan. And when you plan something down to the T and then something happens, it, it throws you off. But I've learned with the Red Cross, it's okay when things don't go exactly according to plan. Um, I just have to jump in and figure something out to now make it work since my first plan didn't go so well. So it's just about, you know, trial and error as well too. You know, so of course, yes, I get frustrated sometimes, Carrie, you've heard me vent, but it's nothing that would deter me from doing it. You know, it's just, like I said, things that happen that, that you didn't plan for, but, you know, you have to make the best of it. You know, when life throws you some lemons, you had to make lemonade. That's right. Even the best laid plans. Right. We spend, like uh, Janae said in her video, we spend 12 weeks uh, for the most part planning these blood drives. And even still with all the planning that goes into place, like I said, natural disasters, power outages, or Janae, you a couple weeks ago, both. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so right. yes, thank you so much. And you talked about a little bit about this, but what would you say the biggest challenge that you face most often day to day in your job is? Well, one of the biggest things I would say is getting the donors to come in and getting the donors to sign up. And that's because as Joanne and I mentioned in the video, we, we didn't even know that before we started working at the Red Cross that it was a need for blood. So um, I definitely would say that that's one of my biggest challenges. So um, to try and get over that hump, I have to do my part in educate our sponsors, you know, the individuals who actually hold the blood drives for us and make sure that they understand the importance of, you know, donors signing up for the blood drive and so that they can pass that information along so that that can put any, you know, first time donors at ease, you know, when they understand why it's so important to sign up, then, you know, that makes a difference. So, the biggest challenge, Carrie, I would say, is just trying to make sure that I get the information out there to the donors and in turn, the donors sign up, you know, based off the information that was given to them. Yeah, and if Absolutely. I can add to that, um, I know we talk, um, Janae, Carrie, and I, we, we'll talk about the, the inverse of sometimes you have people come and you might have to turn them away because we have too many people for that day or something happens, right? Again, something outside of our control happens. Maybe we have less people working that day um, or for whatever reason. And then you have to tell someone who actually wants to donate. And we're like, we work so hard to get you here. And then now we have to tell you that we can't see, we can't take you today, but please, please, please sign up for another day. That's, that's also hard. Yes, very. Yeah, I think we can all agree. That is probably one of our least favorite parts of the job is having yes. to turn away a willing and excited donor for sure. So what kind of strategies uh, do we use to calm a patient or calm a situation where a patient, patient's behavior is threatening to our staff or other patients? So what I would say is, I, I don't think necessarily we deal with threatening behavior so much as we do with um, anxious, um, fearful folks that are coming in for a first time donation and they're scared, um, very nervous. And they're, you know, we check their pulse and their pulse is racing. Um, so I think more so that, um, how do we deal with it? Um, you know, some of the videos they talked about connecting with uh, our donors on a personal level. You know, Cynthia joked that she sings with her donors. So I think just really connecting with them, finding out why they're there, right? Something drew them to come in. It might be a personal story, might be a personal story of someone else, um, but there's a reason why they came in. And I think connecting with them typically does ease their fears. Joanna, what's a difficult situation that you faced on the job and something that you're most proud of? Yeah, so my difficult situation, I would say it was is working with um, maybe a difficult person or someone that maybe perceived as a difficult person. And I winning over someone who's 
feeling like or is 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 being difficult um that's a huge win for me i can be really proud of that and so i have a few of those um in my pocket over the last 12 years um but a lot of times it's um maybe someone who might get labeled as having a strong personality right but really a lot of we like people with strong personality we like people who are driven um that are on top of it, that know how to ask what they want because they make great um, blood drive uh, coordinators because <laughs> they're on top of it and they, they're not afraid to ask people to come and donate. Um, but on top of maybe someone being like that and they're upset and they're frustrated and then I get a phone call and they're like, the website's not working or I, you know, just whatever they're frustrated about. So I get them and they're, they're up here. And um, what I've learned is how like number one, not taking it personally, not letting it um, affect me, my emotions. And I can just say, I'm here to listen. Um, I'm here to help. Let me understand. And um, this person in particular was passed from one person to another, which is already frustrating <laughs> in and of itself when you're like, I just want answers. And then someone's like, oh, okay, well, I'd like you to go talk to this person. And then that person says, oh, okay, I can have you talk to this person. So I think just being there for people um, and connecting on a human level, like has already been said, um, that really, yeah, I, I love being able to do that, even though in that moment, it's like, I don't wanna be here. <laughs> I don't wanna work with this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I definitely get what you're saying. And uh, sometimes we do deal with folks uh, externally who are feeling challenged or frustrated or what have you. Um, I, I'm sure you guys can probably gather Joanna has a pretty um, calm demeanor about her. So she does a great job getting folks back down here so that we can uh, problem solve for them. Janae, what advice would you give someone who wants to pursue the same career as you? The first thing that I would say is you definitely have to have patience. You do. Um, like Joanna mentioned, you're going to run into those difficult situations and you have to have patience. We, we cannot, you know, um, be short with our sponsors or our donors. And it's really because they don't know a lot of the information. So you have to be patient with them so that um, you can give them a clear understanding of what they're dealing with. And the other thing, Carrie, I would say, just like everyone's mentioned um, in the videos and everything is you definitely have to be compassionate. You do, you have to be understanding and loving and caring. It, they're going to know if you're not genuine. They're, they're going to know, they're going to pick up on that quickly. And that's like for the donors and the volunteers and for the sponsors who, you know, hold the blood drives for us. You, you have to be genuine with them. Absolutely. Thanks for that. All right. So there was a question about what other career opportunities are available here for phlebotomists um, and outside of the Red Cross. And then what skills and qualities do you need um, in order to promote? So Cynthia talked a bit in her video about she is a phlebotomist. She was hired on as a phlebotomist and then has since become a driver, a power red technician, which she mentioned is to RBC. That's a power red donation. Um, and you have to be specially trained for that. So that is considered a promotion within um, the phlebotomy world. She's also a driver and she talked about that she wants to become an OJI, which is an on the job instructor. So the folks would sit in the classroom with a Biba and then would go out into the field and work with these OJIs to really hone their skills and become um, phlebotomists. Um, something we wanted to uh, touch on a bit is that working for the Red Cross as a phlebotomist is very different than working say in a lab. So in a lab, you're taking tubes. Um, if any of you have ever had blood drawn in a lab, it's, it's typically pretty quick where our folks um, are actually in giving blood and, um, you know, Janae talked about the time of actual needle in the arm. These folks are spending 15 to 20 minutes with, um, you know, their donors. So it is a much more personal and, and connected feel than say working in a lab. Joanna, can you talk a little bit about the collections trainer role and what experiences are needed? Yeah, and I'll, I'll reiterate what Abiba talked about because um, she was the, the trainer um, and she gets to work with new staff or existing staff when they're learning um, a new skill or maybe a new procedure. And that does happen. Um, so she was saying that the good uh, traits of a good instructor were patience. Uh, I think Weedy also talked about patience, um, knowledge, 
um, and I would say the ability to find the right answers, right? So you, you don't have to know everything to be the trainer, but you, as long as you know where to find it and, you know, it might be similar to if you had to do like a research paper for school, it's a skill that you use later in life too. I Google stuff all the time. And so I just have to be able to find all that information and then uh, make it bite-sized for people. Um, and then she was talking about being prepared, getting your material ready, also skills that you would have in doing a paper. Um, and she talked about respecting people um, and their backgrounds and their experiences. And then the question there's also about, um, is it possible to go from being a phlebotomist to being a trainer? So yes, I mean, so Cynthia was talking about wanting to kind of go on that route. I've worked with people um, like in, in my position as kind of a, a support, an administrative support for Carrie and Janae. I've had a phlebotomist come work with me there. I've seen the phlebotomists go into volunteer services, equipment management. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities that pop up um, once you're within the organization and um, yeah. Awesome, thanks Joanna. Yeah, I think um, you'll, you'll kind of gather the trend that all of us here at Red Cross have to have patience, right? I think everybody's mentioned it in, in every uh, aspect of the field trip. So I did wanna to touch on a couple of the questions that came um, in chat, because I know we're getting close on time. Um, so uh, why do we think people are afraid of giving blood? So most often, and uh, the most common answer is people are afraid. Um, they're afraid of needles. And um, that is the number one uh, thing that I, I hear from folks out in the field. Um, I will say the number one reason why people don't give blood is because they've never been asked. So not necessarily a fear, um, but they just flat have never been asked. Uh, how many times can a person donate blood? So a person is eligible to donate whole blood every 56 days. So we do have certain partners that'll partner with us every two months to make sure that you know, their pool of donors is able to donate every time that they're eligible every 56 days. Uh, let's see, how did you decide you wanted to work in blood donation? Uh, so I actually previously worked for a university um, while I was going through school and um, my uncle was battling brain cancer and very casually said that he was going to be going to get a, another blood transfusion. And my aunt, my cousin, any of us had had no idea that he was receiving transfusions um, and it was pretty regular. Um, and he uh, battled brain cancer for a very long time. So he received many, uh, many transfusions. So that really brought to light for me the need. And um, he's here with us today because of uh, donors that we work with that like the ones we work with every day. Um, an interesting question came through uh, when giving blood, getting blood from another person, does it change your behavior or anything else? So it's, it's unlike organ donation, right? Where you hear the, these really cool stories that they take on personality traits. It's not necessarily that way. So like Janae talked in the video, uh, we do, or in the hospitals, they will match up uh, blood types to make sure it's compatible. But no, you're not taking away any behaviors or uh, characteristics. Great question though. All right. Um, how difficult, actually Janae, I'm gonna let you take this one. How difficult was it to transition into COVID-19 guidelines for blood donations? So you've been out in the field since right. late February and all the changes and our favorite word pivot, right? So I'll let right, you take exactly. this one. Um, it was definitely a challenge, of course. Um, like I mentioned, um, this was something that was new to everybody. It was new to the world. It was new to the world of donating blood. So it was definitely a transitional period for sure. Um, but once we got down the requirements and the regulations that we needed to follow, I think that things went smoother because once we got the information out to the donors, they felt more comfortable. They're like, okay, so you guys are thinking about COVID-19. So, you know, and you guys are taking precautions. So once the information finally reached the donors in the community, the public, then I feel like things went smoother, Carrie, but it was just hard uh, when, you know, everything first hit because, you know, people were scared just to even go to the grocery store. So coming out to donate blood was, you know, scarier than that. But once we got the information out, I think it was a smoother transition. Yeah, it's been an interesting ride while we've watched, um, you know, we've called it the roller coaster because when COVID first hit, everyone was locked down. 
the need for blood went down because folks weren't driving. There were not as many accidents. Um, people were postponing surgeries and um, things like that. So the need went crazy down. Um, and we kind of had to adjust our collections based on that, um, which kind of ties right into one of the questions was, after the blood expires, how do you dispose of it? So blood does have a 42 day shelf life, which is why myself, Joanna, Janae are out there every day trying to collect the blood that we need um, to make sure that we've got blood on the shelves for the patients in need. Um, with that, uh, we really try not to um, dispose of any blood products, but it would be disposed of in a, a biomedical biohazard. Um, one really cool thing about Red Cross is because we support uh, so many different hospitals, if the blood is not used here locally, uh, it will be moved to somewhere where it can be used. So because we have such a huge net network nationwide, very seldomly are there gonna be products that are not gonna be used. Something I learned early on that um, was really touching to me was we have hospital contracts, but if we have a hospital reach out to us that needs blood and we are not contracted with them, we will still provide them with blood products um, because one, we don't want that uh, blood to go to waste and two, we are in the business of saving lives. So whether they're contracted with us or not, we will supply uh, those hospitals with that blood. So, and I know uh, we're probably getting close to the end of class time. Um, I don't know, Didi, if you want me to continue on with a couple of questions or if we wanna. Uh, Jen, uh, uh, Ms. Dangerfield, I'm gonna defer to you. Do we have a few more minutes? We do, yeah. I'll, um, okay. I, I do wanna leave maybe two or three, maybe about 2.15 we wrap up at least for the survey part, but yeah. yeah. Absolutely, okay, very good. Just didn't wanna run into any of your stuff. No worries, thank you. All right. So Janae, what is one of the favorite parts of your job and what parts would you wanna change? Um, so as I mentioned in my video, my favorite part is helping people. That makes me feel good each and every day because being out in the field, you really do see how the work that you do affects other people. And that part of it, I love. That makes me feel good at the end of the day when I go home and I've been through those challenges we talked about, Carrie, that's what, um, you know, pushes me each and every day. Those smiles that I get or those hugs or those tears that I get for helping someone or their family member um, is definitely my favorite part. And to be honest, if I could change something, it would just be my ability to actually help more people. You know, I feel like I'm only doing a small pool in my territory, but if I could change something, it would be to expand and help as many people as I, as I can. Well, I will tell you guys that uh, Janae does a phenomenal job in her territory and has grown a ton um, just in, in the time that she's been an account manager. So she does touch a lot of lives, not only in the blood products she collects, but also just in her interactions with donors and folks out in the field every day. All right, Joanna, what's a big mistake that you've made on the job and how did you fix it? Uh, the correct answer is I don't make mistakes. No, just kidding. That's right. Um, Ever, never. None, none of us do, right? So many mistakes, but it, it does say a big mistake. Um, I will say from a phlebotomist, for the phlebotomist, I do not envy that they, I mean, it's FDA regulated. So what I, I mean, if I'm ever at a blood drive, I let them focus on what they're doing because they need to do things exactly, precisely. So I respect um, the phlebotomists and all of the, you know, people in manufacturing, um, all of that, because that can be hard. Um, I know for myself, um, if I make a mistake, um, I think a big part of how to handle that is to own up to it, to figure out, you know, what, what did I do? Um, what did I do wrong? And it takes a lot of humility, um, but I have to ask for help. Um, if it's not something that I can fix on my own, I need to tell my manager, I need to get a different department involved to just uh, just take a deep breath and say, okay, we're gonna be okay. And we can, we can fix this. Um, and yeah, just getting help and working as a team uh, is how I fixed it. Awesome, thanks for that. Yeah, we all make mistakes, right? And I think our biggest thing is when we can just own it. All right. Janae, how often do you have to deal with people who are not cooperative and how do you handle it? 
I would say, you know, the nature of our job, I don't have to deal with a lot of people who are, you know, that way. But I will say I have run into that, of course, a few times. And a big thing that I've learned doing this is they want to be heard. They want what, you know, the issues that they're having, they want them addressed. So I definitely take the time to listen to uh, what they have to say, if it's them just venting or letting me know what they're frustrated about or letting me know what can be changed. Um, I I'm all for that. So I think that that's a big way to handle it is to make sure that I'm hearing them out and addressing their concerns. Um, and, you know, we run into that sometimes, Carrie, when, you know, we have these BPLs, like we mentioned on the field trip, that was an in honor of drive. So that BPL, I'm sure was, you know, gung ho about everything. They wanted to do everything that they could to help out. But then I run into some sponsors sometimes where it's something that's assigned to them. You know, it's not really something that they volunteer for. And when I run into those situations, um, I try to let them know how important it is um, the task that they've been assigned, how important it is and what it means to the world. Uh, like, you know, those people in the video at the end of the educational piece, exactly. So I definitely show them things like that to try to ease them into it a little bit more to not feel like, okay, this is something that I have to do, but then, you know, change it into, this is something that I have to do, but actually this is a really good thing. So, you know, that's kind of how I deal with those situations when I run into them. Awesome, thank you for sharing. and. Um... For those of you, uh, she mentioned BPL several times. So that's our blood program leaders. Those are our folks that are actually in the field and sponsoring the blood drives, recruiting the donors and hosting us um, so that we can collect blood. Uh, Joanna, what is some advice you would give to a student in high school who's interested in healthcare or a related career? Yeah, I really like what Janae said in hers about don't give up. Um, I say, go for it. Ask questions um, of the people around you, of adults, people maybe um, who are learning and doing the same thing. Um, it might be intimidating, but I know if someone asked me, like kind of the questions that you're asking, I'm like, oh, I want to answer this. You know, it's exciting. People, people actually like to talk about themselves a lot. So if you ask questions, <laughs> um, they'd probably be more than happy to to answer it. And um, but it can, it's that step of 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 asking um, someone who can help. Um, have those answers. And I would just not shut out any options just because you feel like something might be intimidating. If you're like, oh, I don't know if I could become a nurse or a doctor or whatever that thing is, there might be other ways or other ways you could do that same thing and it'll just look a little bit different, maybe a different job title. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. All right, Miss Dangerfield. Well, I think we are at our time, so I will turn it to you. Thank you. Um, guys, I, it's, I know it's weird over virtual, but round of applause. For our oh, thank speakers. you so much. Thank you all so thank much. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, we really appreciate having you in our classroom. Absolutely. Um, so students, um, if, uh, we do have a survey about the field trip that we'd like you guys to answer. So I've assigned it as um, homework in Google Classroom. I am going to go ahead and post it now. What I'd recommend is um, after you jump off the call, just do it right now while it's fresh in your head. It's not a super long survey. It just gives you know feedback on uh, what you learn. So please just finish that. I think I put the official due time as tonight. So yeah, thank you again, everybody. I All think right, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Jen, Take oh, wait, 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 one moment. Oh, Jen, I'm sorry. sorry. I just need to um, jump in with a, a, a few thank yous here. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, all of you for joining Wender Weiss Foundation for Children and the Red Cross for today's virtual field trip. Um, it was a real pleasure for all of us to spend this time with you. And we hope you enjoyed meeting people um, in healthcare who love what they do. And we just wanted to introduce you to some entry level opportunities um, at the, the Red Cross and in blood services that you might want to consider for after high school. Um, and we have everybody's email addresses from today and are happy to share them. If you guys have any follow-up questions, we'll share them with um, Ms. Dangerfield as well. And she can share that with you later. And one other thing I'm also gonna share with you guys is a, an entry-level healthcare career guide um, that also has additional entry-level positions in healthcare 
that you can consider with descriptions and videos and links to other information as well as free training options for those um, careers and summer um, work experience ideas. So I'll pass that along as well. Um, so with that, that said, um, I just wanna call out a heartfelt thank you um, to a few folks who worked really hard to make today possible. Um, first of all, I wanna thank our wonderful team from the Red Cross, um, Carrie, Janae, and Joanna. Um, you guys are amazing, as um, Ms. Dangerfield said, and uh, a special shout out to Carrie Morris, without whom today would not have been possible. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Next, I also want to um, give a huge thank you to our awesome partners, partner at um, Andrew Hill High School, um, Jen Dangerfield Barber, thank you so much for working with us on, on today and, and at these events. Um, I also want to shout out to um, Amy Wender from Wenderweiss Foundation for Children uh, for her ongoing support for this program. And finally, but especially, I want to thank all of you students for um, joining us today and for your engagement and participation. We loved being with you. So thank you. And I'm um, passing it back to, to Thank you, Didi, for all the work you did to help to put this together also. We appreciate you. All right, guys. Um, that being said, you may hop off the call if you'd like. Uh, finish your survey, please. <laughs> Maybe finish before you hop off. But um, if you would like to go work asynchronously, you may do so. All I'll right. see all of you on Thank you again. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>